Just going to say good morning, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, so many colleagues and friends here, it's difficult to begin, <laughs> but we will begin. Um, I'm Elizabeth Cropper, Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts here at the National Gallery of Art. And on behalf of the trustees of the National Gallery, I want to welcome all of you here today for the first session in this symposium dedicated to the question of creativity and the sketch. I'm going to leave it to the organizers, Hank Millen and Irving Levin, to lay out their design for this concerto. It's very interesting for us here at the gallery that that concerto or pensiero is an idea that Salvatore Settis began to lay out for us quite coincidentally uh, last Sunday in his first Mellon lecture. Um, but I want to thank um, Hank Millen and Irving Levin very, very much for putting this uh, very ambitious and exciting program together. And I should also thank uh, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations at the J. Seward Johnson Senior Charitable Trust and, the Mrs. and Mrs. F. Merle Smith for their support for this symposium here and at Princeton. And I want to give uh, a special welcome to our friends from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton who are co-sponsoring co this event. We've had um, joint ventures before here at the center, but I think this symposium is special in terms of its complexity, including two venues and with material to be presented through various different media. Um, the National Gallery and CASVA have inherited a remarkable legacy from Hank Millen, about which I learn more every single day I'm here. But perhaps the most remarkable in terms of events such as this is a spirit of cooperation and absolute can-do attitude among the staff of the center. And the spirit of teamwork here is such that I even hesitate to single anyone out for special thanks. But I would be very sorry indeed not to thank Associate Dean Teresa O'Malley for all of her work in planning this event, and especially uh, Kimberly Rodefer, who's probably outside the door rather than here, for her persistence and good humor over the past months as assistant to the program of scholarly meetings here at the center. We have a couple of revisions uh, just to notice in the program. Um, Carlo Ossola from the Collège de France could not be present to deliver his paper, but we have uh, a translated version of his paper available to you, um, I think, uh, on the table outside, if anybody wants to pick that up. Um, unfortunately, Enrico Castelnuovo was also unable to come, and we've um, taken the opportunity of the space uh, left uh, uh, for his paper this afternoon to ask Peter Parshall of the National Gallery to come and talk briefly about the really uh, wonderful exhibition which is just being uh, installed at the moment on the unfinished print, and it's actually a rather nice uh, connection with uh, this program in terms of its theme. Um, I will tell you that all of you who are registered in the symposium are entitled to a 20% discount in the gallery shop today. So um, that is an extra uh, bonus uh, for being here. And remind you that the symposium continues on Thursday and Friday at the Institute for Advanced Study in, Pris in Princeton. And if you need a map or any directions for getting there, we also have those available to you outside. Um, but the day is now here when I think we will all think about the sketch together, and I want to turn over the podium to Hank Millen to introduce the first session of the program. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at this uh, podium under the aegis of the Center for Advanced Study and its dean, who I particularly would like to thank for the opportunity uh, to moderate this first session of the symposium on the sketch in the arts and sciences, the session on architecture. It's also a pleasure to have the Center and the Institute for Advanced Study collaborate in preparing and planning the symposium. The patience and good nature um, of the members of the staffs of both institutions during this process were always and everywhere evident and uh, deeply appreciated. As you may have 
read on the final fold of today's program, the evidence available seems to indicate that the use of drawings as a preliminary stage in the planning of a painting, a sculpture, or architecture may not have occurred before the late Middle Ages or early Renaissance. Now, if this be so, the iterative process accepted today as usual in the arts, literature, engineering, mathematics, and the sciences may have been discovered or invented in the early modern period. I must admit, though, <clears throat> evidence to the contrary, that I find it hard to imagine uh, Herodotus or Thucydides, Virgil, Livy, or Ovid uh, not pondering what they had just written and not thinking about altering that draft, uh, which might have actually been written on a wax tablet first, uh, to improve the content and the meaning for a final state. Is it not also possible, though perhaps not demonstrable, that the paradigmata or models that are cited in Greek texts that record contracts for construction may have served also as initial, an initial purpose, at least, in uh, testing the many issues that are addressed in the design of a work of architecture. Thereafter, the paradigmata served as guides to be followed in construction, as stated in the documents. Now, aspects of the papers in this morning's sessions will call attention to the iterative process in architectural design, in drawings, and in models. Of considerable interest to students of the history of architecture is the discussion of the iterative process in design, that given by Leon Battista Alberti in his On the Art of Building, drafted in the middle of the 15th century. In book two on materials, Alberti mentions the importance of models several times in, quote, the design and construction of all the elements to allow one to increase or decrease the size of these elements freely, to make new proposals and alterations until everything fits together well and meets with approval. Alberti there counsels not only consideration of structure, materials, and, quote, the relationship between the site and the surrounding district, that is, contextual concerns, but also, through examination and study of the model, quote, new proposals and alterations until everything fits together well. Alberti describes an iterative process of trial, study, and adjustments to reach a state of approval. A sophisticated awareness of the iterative process in design is described later in Book 9 on Ornament of Private Buildings. Quote, but I can say this of myself, I have often conceived of projects in the mind that seemed quite commendable at the time, but when I translated them into drawings, I found several errors in the very parts that delighted me most, and quite serious ones. Again, when I return to drawings and measure the dimensions, I recognize and lament my carelessness. Finally, when I pass from the drawings to the model, sometimes I notice further mistakes in the individual parts, even over the numbers." Close quote. Now, as we've seen from the passage quoted in Book 2, the model may then be the subject of further iterative procedures until the design arrives at an acceptable level of satisfaction. Yet further, we know of examples when the iterative process continues after construction is underway. But that's another story. Do we have evidence that drawings and models were altered or adjusted in the process of their construction? Time allotted for this introduction allows citing only two examples of extant models with associated drawings made for Michelangelo as he worked on St. Peter's in Rome. One was a model made in 1556 for the design of the apse vault of the south hemicycle or transept. The model and the design 
were substantially altered when an error in construction of the apse vault itself in the spring of 1557 enabled Michelangelo to reassess the design. The changes resulted in the ribbed vault that we all know with deep gores that suggest a skeletal structure that was to inspire architects such as Borromini in the 17th century. The second example is the model for the drum and dome of St. Peter's built from 1558 to 1561. In this case, there are drawings made of the model by Giovantonio Dosio in 1560 and a description of the model by Giorgio Vasari reflecting his examination of the model in late 1560 before the model was completed. The drawings by Dozio include later discarded oval alternatives for the panels on the inner surface of the inner dome and include representations of consistent pediments above the windows of the drum on both the interior and exterior. Much of this material James Ackerman has dealt with beautifully in his uh, monograph on Michelangelo. The, the model today has circular tondi rather than oval panels on the inner surface of the dome. And on the drum, the model still retains triangular pediments on the exterior and segmental on the interior. Though, as the drum of the basilica was constructed from 1562 onward, Michelangelo had the pediments alternate between triangular and segmental on both the interior and exterior of the drum. Now many buildings, when compared with their earlier models and drawings, show changes that may have occurred for a variety of reasons. Some were plausibly changes necessitated by unforeseen situations, such as that which required Alberti in a letter to Matteo di Pasti in Rimini, the supervisor of construction at San Francesco, to include a sketch in the margin of the letter of a volute that would both make a transitional element between a wider lower level and a tall upper level of the facade, and as well hide the protruding portion of an existing roof between the two levels. The change in scale itself from the model to the full-size monument may at times suggest alterations that were accomplished during construction. If so, these, as well as the changes in models, alterations in drawings, and rethinking of designs for structural or other reasons constitute iterative moments in the development of a design. The two and three-dimensional sketches that became common in the 16th century and continue to our day. It is these moments of learning by seeing that are of the greatest interest. It was while visiting the Guggenheim Museum in Venice a few years ago that I saw an exhibition of Frank Gehry's designs for the museum in Bilbao. Joseph Giovannini was installing the exhibition and walked us through the sequence of spaces. There were many drawings of the numerous schemes that led to the final design, but most striking to me were the dozen large-scale models chronicling the various stages in the development of the design. The models delighted me most because they were the embodiment of what we suspect had, in a modified form, been the practice in earlier studios as architects in previous centuries had studied designs with models. Few, if any, of these study models, development models that served an iterative process in design, from the Renaissance and later have been preserved. As a stage in the process of achieving a building, and not as an end in themselves, study models lose their utility once the structure is achieved. They are cumbersome, and were usually discarded without any visual record remaining. It is possible the sketch model is used more frequently today than it was in the past, that technology has facilitated the making of models, the models made today by Frank Gehry and Greg Lynn, for example, among others, uh, provide not only an opportunity for them to perceive directly, study, and modify their spatial and structural conceptions, but also, when preserved and recorded, enable critics and historians of the early 20th, first century to grasp more fully 
the path into the unknown being explored by today's architects. Now the pattern we will be following this morning is after each paper there'll be a period for questions. We'll have a coffee break after the second uh, paper by uh, Professor Boudon uh, and uh, then uh, return here for the remainder of the session. The first speaker uh, this morning is uh, James Ackerman. Uh, <coughs> Professor Ackerman was uh, educated at Yale and the Institute of uh, Fine Arts at uh, New York University. Uh, he taught at Berkeley before accepting a position at Harvard uh, where he taught until his retirement. He's also been a visiting professor at Columbia, the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, MIT, and the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. The recipient of, a, of numerous honorary degrees in the US and abroad, Professor Ackerman is also a corresponding fellow <coughs> of many foreign academies and an honorary fellow of the Academia di San Luca in Rome. Among his other honors, uh, the gold medal from the Institute of uh, History of Art, uh, of Lombard History of Art, the Premio Dario Borghese from in Rome, and he is a uh, grand officer in the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic. Professor Ackerman is among the best known and most admired historians of architecture in the United States. His uh, first monograph on the Cortile del Belvedere in the Vatican uh, that was begun, begun by Bramante, was followed by a two-volume work, uh, The Architecture of Michelangelo, a monograph on Palladio, Palladio's Villas, a volume uh, entitled The Villa, Form and Ideology of Country Houses, which was the publication of the Andrew W. Mellon Lectures given here at the National Gallery in 1985. Uh, Distance Points, Studies in Theory and Renaissance Art and Architecture, uh, which we're all extremely grateful for because it gathers a number of articles that were in some uh, widely uh, dispersed uh, journals. Uh, uh, with, and that uh, received the uh, AIA Award for History and Theory. Last year, he and Wolfgang Jung edited a work on the conventions of architectural drawing representations and misrepresentation, in which he contributed an introductory essay on the conventions and rhetoric of architectural drawing. Most of his scholarly life, Professor Ackerman has been thinking and writing about architectural drawings, and it's a privilege to have him speak to us this morning about the three categories of drawings uh, in the beginnings of architectural sketching. Professor Ackerman. Thank you, Hank, and the organizers of this uh, symposium. Uh, yes, I can see better if it's higher. Good. Uh, my talk is itself a sketch in the form of statements about the origin of sketching. The, the statement mode is going to sound arbitrary, but the lack of nuance uh, is often, as in other sketches, an advantage of liberation from convention. Medieval draftsmen, with certain exceptions, didn't sketch freely, but made preparation for a definitive work. This is an example of one of the exceptions. Sometimes architects engraved or scratched architectural or structural elements on the walls of a building while it was being built. The difficulty of doing this understandably reduced the spontaneity we associate with sketching. In the model books of medieval figural artists, Images are sometimes 
unfinished, but they rarely exhibit the freedom and exploration we associate with the sketch. This is primarily due to the unavailability of cheap surfaces on which to doodle. Parchment, which was the standard surface of medieval draftsmen, was costly enough to discourage both painters and architects from imaginative flights. It was reported that Brunelleschi worked out the profile of a dome at the seashore in the sand. The bringing of paper manufacture to the West in the 14th century, uh, about 1,200 years later than it was available in China, according to Jim Cahill, with whom I spoke this morning, it provided the cheap surface. Even before, however, uh, there were fresco painters who could do experimental sketches of the walls upon which they subsequently laid the plaster ground for their painting. Uh, this is uh, the, a Sinopia record of the painter Altichiero, who was overlapping with Giotto in time. Uh, and it's, it's quite remarkable because it, it has no relation to a composition. There's the head of a man, there's a child, uh, another man in between, a child here, uh, at that point, uh, behind the child, there's a, a pussy-like lion, and there's some men struggling down below. I apologize for the slide. The one I ordered from Verona eight weeks ago arrived yesterday. Uh, the uh, fresco painters uh, could do uh, such experimental sketches, but rarely did. It's more recreation than exploration. I believe the artist didn't learn much from doing it. If uh, the origins of sketching are given such a, a material uh, explanation, then uh, it wouldn't explain the fact that mural surfaces were very rarely used. And that's because of the concept of what it meant to be an artist in the Middle Ages. Uh, art meant craft, and uh, the concept of self-expression or, or artistic experiment uh, and recording experiences wasn't highly developed. Pisanello, in the mid-15th century, could qualify as the inventor of sketching. He, he continued the tradition of a pattern book, but his vital interest in the world around him led him to new subjects and new observations and new means of recording them. This drawing is the first on-site description of a current event in history documenting the visit of the Byzantine Emperor, John VIII Paleologus, and the Patriarch of Constantinople to the Council of Florence at some uh, time, maybe around their arrival in 1439. It's the nearest Renaissance artist ever got to media coverage, which is to say that its principal purpose it was to produce a memento of the event. Pisanello was intrigued by the dress of the visitors, the harness of the horses, and the strange Arabic inscription. The sheet illustrates the importance of paper. The artist could hardly have made his notes on the streets of town on parchment. In Italy, this achievement bore no fruit. The classical bias of Renaissance culture scorned topical mimesis of this sort, which was revisited only a century and a half later. Leonardo da Vinci was the quintessential sketcher. 
sketching was the way in which he investigated nature, solved problems, developed composition, and fantasized. Rarely were the sketches meant to be seen by others, though some were developed into the intended uh, illustrations of uh, treatises such as ones on anatomy and mechanics. Like Pisadello, he'd covered the paper sheet with a variety of studies, perhaps partly for reasons of economy, but also because it was convenient to pick up whatever sheet was on the table that had space left on it. The one on the left is an extreme example of his obsessive drive to record everything in the world and in his head. It contains a number of geometrical diagrams, the head of an old man, a pair of trees, soldiers, one on horseback, clouds and rain, an illumination motif, the top of a campanile, and a lily rising from grasses. Probably nothing here was directed to the realization of a particular project. It is simply a document of the artist's imagination. In contrast to the fresco Sinopia, it was generated by a search of discovery. Leonardo was the first sketcher of architecture whose work has survived. No project of his was ever built, with the possible exception of a, a simple villa. Though some were commissioned, none was developed beyond the sketch phase, and no ideas represented by more than one sketch, ex except for perspectives that accompanied plans. Although structures uh, could not have been built uh, from these drawings, those for churches uh, contain a prophetic vision of a new architecture of domes supported by molded piers uh, that was realized less than a decade later in the design of St. Peter in Rome. Uh, here are Br Donato Bramante's initial thoughts about the building, that is St. Peter. He had a assisted draw squares on the sheet, partly because an accurate record of the early Christian basilica and the 15th century choir had to be drawn first to assure their calibration with the new scheme. This is the Constantinian basilica here with its columns and the 15th century choir is up above and you can see how important the relationship of the new and old were. The four piers that was su to support a dome appear in four different stages of development in the middle here, finishing with a solution close to the famous presentation drawing on parchment. I think we could say that we go from this to that uh, to this and end up there, which is represented on the parchment presentation drawing on uh, the right. It was in the Fabrica of St. Peter that modern architectural drawing was developed. The processes of thought and sketching in the sheet, experiments toward a design solution, have remained the same through radical shifts in style and materials right up to the very recent improvements in computer-aided design. That is to say, I, I regard these improvements as changing the whole picture. The dynamic fortification drawings done by Michelangelo for the besieged city of Florence in 1529 are unique in the history of architecture. They, too, also show open-minded experiment, though they do not end in a proposal. Fantastic and prophetic, 
combining extraordinary vitality with a degree of control and so expressively vigorous that the lines of fire bursting from the apertures become part of the design. They nevertheless show no effort to fulfill the charge to protect the city, which was already under fire and in no position to construct masonry bastions, the building of which would have taken years and huge uh, expenditures. He didn't fiddle while uh, Florence burned, he sketched. These two sketches for the proposed church of San Giovanni de Fiorentini in Rome are creative in very different ways. That of Antonio da San Gallo, the younger on the left, represents the design, uh, 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 represents the heritage of his mentor, Bramante. It ingeniously combines on one sheet a proposal for a longitudinal church with side chapels, uh, and for a centralized one with a ring of chapels. He later made on separate sheets clean versions of each. He drew also the elevation of one bay up there at the top of the central plan version. Uh, that of Michelangelo on the right proposes only one solution, but it eloquently expresses process. The walls seem to pulsate in a state of becoming. It is clear that as an architect, he thinks as a sculptor. As in the fortification drawings, there are lines that have nothing to do with structure. In this case, they represent visual and conceptual axes. Not all informal sketching falls under the heading of creativity. A large portion of Renaissance, pre-Renaissance, and, well, I won't speak of pre-Renaissance except for this one piece, and later architectural sketches are representations of existing buildings, primarily ancient Roman ones. But here uh, we're in the in 1390, where the architect of San Petronio in Bologna comes to Milan and makes a plan and section of uh, the new cathedral in order to take back home and, uh, and contemplate uh, when he arrives there. As a matter of fact, it's measured both in Bolognese and Milanese uh, uh, figures. There are virtually no sketches of the medieval buildings that uh, surround the citizens of Renaissance towns. There's hardly a moment in subsequent history when architects didn't make sketch notes on the architecture of the past. The invention of photography did not much The invention of photography did not much diminish this activity. The draftsman can record much more than the photographer, for example, in showing the inside and outside and or the plan and elevation of a building in the same drawing. Uh, this is uh, just chosen at random. This is uh, a drawing of what uh, Baldessari Peruzzi saw when he visited Ostia, and he makes scattered notes all over the place. Renaissance records of ancient buildings could include um, efforts to reconstruct them based on the evidence of the remains, such as the one on the right, which refuses to appear 
uh, so I'll forget it. Accuracy, fidelity to the evidence were not high priorities in the 15th and 16th century. The reconstructions were made primarily as a stimulus to design and an attempt to visualize what architects read in the treatise of uh, Vitruvius. Oh, there it is. Uh, that's uh, the same dozio mentioned by uh, Henry Millen uh, 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 reconstructs a, uh, a building in Rome. A uh, comparable representation of what existed was not a common concern of painters, though they used ancient sculpture the way architects used buildings. Uh, such sketches as those in the portfolio of Fra Bartolomeo and of the countryside with architectural elements were rare. Perhaps these were intended to provide a workbook for the studio to refer to in painting landscape backgrounds, but they give the impression of plein air uh, records and are more mimetic than the views that were incorporated in paintings. Mimesis had a bad reputation in Renaissance art theory. Most Renaissance painters did not use drawing to explore and experiment or as an end in themselves. Raphael, as this example for the fresco of the School of Athens shows, uh, was typical in employing sketching primarily to block out compositions or to refine details of compositions already organized in his mind. Michelangelo made some drawings as integral works of art, but they were finished works and not sketches. Uh, Giorgio Vasari, writing in 1568, defined sketches in this limited sense as the preparation for the poses of figures and the organization of a composition. I close with two sketches of uh, Andrea Palladio, both representing his freest essays in invention. In one case on the left, he tries out on the same sheet as a measured reconstruction of a Roman temple, alternative plans of houses, which are much more modest than any of the dwellings he actually built. It is not likely that he had been given a commission for such structures, and it is unusual for a Renaissance designer uh, to try to imagine solutions to living accommodations that were not demanded at the time. Uh, the drawing on the right is identified with the bows of a gripper, principally because the um, indication of the Pantheon uh, appears uh, and, and the baths abutted that. Like a number of Palladio's drawings from the antique, the forms bear almost no relation to the remains, which, in the case of these baths, uh, were scattered and almost impossible to interpret. But this drawing may have helped Palladio to envision the plan of the Church of the Red Redentori in Venice. In sum, the origin of sketching took many paths, not all of which emphasized creativity. The examples we have seen involve free invention without a goal, as in Altichiero and Leonardo, representation of existing works, uh, such as uh, Dozio and Palladio, preparation for a work, as such as Raphael, Bramante, San Gallo, and Michelangelo. Representation of the natural environment, as in the landscape of Fra Bartolomeo. Representation of an event, as in uh, Pisanello. Fantasy, Leonardo, and Michelangelo's fortifications. What they all have in common, it seems to me, is a kind of invasion of propriety in the sense of one's adherence 
to the current rules and theories of art. The very variety is an echo of the vast and irrepressible reaches of the human mind. Thank you.